Okay, so the next upvoted question is from Jim S. And it's, the question is, experts disagree on many things. One second, something is great. The next, it's a death sentence. What are the three to five most compelling things related to improving health and longevity that you strongly believe in that others might not? For example, using the sauna. And, and then there are some comments there about um, the, the protocol for the sauna and uh, things like that. Um, take a sip of water. So I would say that, um, so the three to five things that I, you know, I think are good for longevity that other people may not think are great. I would say that for one thing, it, that, that doesn't necessarily mean they're the three to five things that are the best. So if we're talking about things that most people do agree on, I would say most people agree, agree cutting out refined sugar, refined carbohydrates is great for longevity. Most people agree that, you know, exercise and not being sedentary is good for longevity. Um, most people agree that high vegetable intake is great. So those things are all obvious, obvious ones, but you know, things that are, that I think are also good for longevity that most people, um, don't necessarily consider. I would definitely say the sauna, uh, using the sauna four times, four times a week would be probably have the highest um, would have the most robust effect. So we know that from studies out of Finland that using the sauna four to seven times a week is, a, is associated with like a 50% lower cardiovascular disease risk, a 66% lower Alzheimer's, a 60% lower dementia risk. Um, so those are, uh, you know, those are really, you know, age-related diseases and certainly cardiovascular disease is one of the, the top killers in the United States and also in a lot of other, other countries as well. Um, the sauna mimics cardiovascular exercise in a lot of respects, but we also know that in addition, you know, in addition to that, it's improving blood vessel, uh, pliability. So, um, blood vessel, blood vessel function, um, it's improving, you know, just the way that your blood vessels are working in general. Uh, it's also allowing your heart to do less work because there's increased plasma volume, um, and, uh, you know, basically your, your blood, your blood is flowing to, to organs a lot easier, which means that your heart has to do less work to pump it, to get, to get it to your different organs, uh, including the brain. And also heat shock proteins are another really, um, pro longevity factor that have been shown in multiple studies, um, including, uh, human studies, um, humans that have a polymorphisms that that make them have more heat shock proteins are more likely to be a centenarian. Um, we know that from, from studies, human studies that um, have looked at heat shock proteins in uh, muscle biopsies um, that sitting in the sauna for in 163 degree Fahrenheit sauna for about 30 minutes can e increase heat shock proteins by about 50%. And that, that lasts for two days. So you don't have to do the sauna for two days and that heat shock increase in heat, heat shock proteins will be sustained for 48 hours, um, which is also really, really nice. So um, the, the studies out of Finland that I cited, that the, the temperature was about 174 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes, at least 20 minutes. So that was, that was sort of like the minimum temperature and the minimum time was about 20 minutes to have the, the robust effect, the 50% lower cardiovascular disease was a 40% lower all-cause mortality, 66% lower Alzheimer's disease car, um, um, related mortality. So um, I think that the four times is the most robust. Two to three times also had an effect. It wasn't quite as robust. For example, instead of a 50% lower cardiovascular disease, uh, cardiovascular disease related mortality, it was a 24% lower risk. So um, not quite as robust, but still you're getting an effect. Uh, but if you really want that pro longevity, I would say the four, four times a week is the, the minimum dose at 174 degrees for about 20 minutes. Um, that would be, and, and at that degree, you're getting the, the you're going to get the heat shock protein effect as well. So that would be one. Um, the second thing I would say would be um, that maybe most people aren't talking about are the broccoli sprouts. I think sulforaphane is an up, up and coming longevity compound. Lots and lots of clinical evidence that it, you know, it 
decreases cancer incidence, decreases cancer recurrence, increases a variety of antioxidant and anti-inflammatory pathways in humans. Uh, it, it lowers um, risk factors and biomarkers for um, you know oxidized LDL and and and, and cardiovascular disease related uh, markers. Good for brain function. I mean, just a whole whole um, list of benefits. So I would say that that's another one that most most um, probably pro longevity people are not talking about. And then the third, I would say, for example, I would say time restricted eating. And I think that's kind of becoming more popular to talk about, at least in this in the in the intermittent fasting respect. People are talking about that being a pro longevity. I would say for sure, time restricted eating within a at least no longer than eleven hour time window preferably like 10 hours. Um, and then I would say the other one is high intensity interval training. It's, it's one that I've become increasingly interested in. And, um, you know, VO2 max is, is a biomarker for aging. We know that, so VO2 max is the ability of your body to take in oxygen during exercise and then transport that oxygen to various tissues. Um, VO2 max decreases by 10% per decade and um, high intensity interval training. In fact, there's been multiple, multiple studies showing that is one of the most efficient ways to increase VO2 max. Aerobic, aerobic exercise absolutely does it as well. But I, when I say efficient, what I mean is, for example, um, studies have shown that doing just 24 sessions of a high intensity interval training protocol 45 minute protocol where you're having like four one minute high intensity pushes, you know, separated by, by, um, you know, active recovery, recovery, and you have a warm up and a cool down period and all that. After 24 sessions, people's VO2 max increased by 12%. And that's like literally turning you back a decade in terms of aging. So I'd say that that is another probably um, up and coming, I'd say, uh, practice for pro longevity that I don't hear a lot of people talking about just yet, but I, I do think that it's going to be um, something that may play a role. Uh, also, it's been shown in clinical studies in humans to increase mitochondrial biogenesis, the growth of new mitochondria in cells um, up to like 70%. And I mean, that's amazing because you're talking about, you know, essentially replacing damaged old dysfunctional mitochondria with young, healthy, new mitochondria and mitochondria are how you're making energy. So uh, that's, you're going to have, you know, more better energy, more efficient energy production. And also you're going to be less likely to leak out damaging byproducts, which are, you know, constantly being made by your mitochondria, reactive oxygen species, free, free oxygen rattle radicals. These things are damaging a variety of, you know, things in your cell, including DNA, including mitochondria. So young mitochondria, you know, leak out less of these damaging product, uh, byproducts than old mitochondria. So if you take like, for example, a 20 year old and compare them to an 80 year old and you look at, um, you look at their, their uh, mitochondrial efficiency, a 20 year old will have less, you know, damaging byproducts being leaked out than, than an 80 year old. So replacing your old damaged mitochondria is also a good thing. Again, high intensity interval training. So I think those are the three things I would say um, most people are not talking about. They're not necessarily end all be all, but they're, they're three things I'd say that, you know, are compelling. And I strongly think they're going to, that are uh, going to make their way into the longevity arena. Um, very soon. Uh, in terms of how many high intensity interval sessions per week, I would say three. Um, in fact, the study that I talked about, so this is Bill asking, the study that I talked about uh, with the 24 sessions, um, that was over an eight week period. And interestingly, that study also looked at people that did, were doing um, more high intensity training within that time period. So they were doing like four or five high intensity interval sessions. There was actually a, a threshold. So after um, the, doing it three times a week, uh, people that started doing it four, five times a week, there was diminishing returns. So their VO2 max did increase, but it was like an 8% increase as opposed to like a 12%, which really suggests that your body needs to recover. So, um, I would say that, you know, probably even two to three times a week would be optimal, um, you know, for the high intensity interval training. 
Uh, you definitely don't want to be doing that like, you know, four or five times a week. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next. Um, yeah. And then in terms of what, what, what is a high intensity interval training? I mean, there's lots of things you can do. Essentially, you're just trying to go, you know, over, over 80% of your maximal oxygen intake. A lot of times what people, what, you know, people do to do that is like a sprint, you know, a, a sprint, a hill sprint. Um, I, I, I do mine on, on stationary bikes, uh, sprinting, and also I do hill sprinting, um, swimming, you can do it with swimming, burpees, all these things you can do lots of, you know, lots of things you can do, uh, for a high intensity interval training. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be just the biking. 